But uh, my name is Jonathan Adler. I'm a professor here at Case Western Reserve University School of Law. I'm also director of the Center for Business Law and Regulation. And uh, let me welcome you to what I think is really uh, an exciting event. Um, we're here to talk about uh, a new book that uh, Thomas McGarity and when, when my colleague Wendy Wagner have recently published with Harvard University Press, Bending Science, How Special Interests Corrupt Public Health Research, uh, an important book that analyzes uh, what happens to science when it gets uh, put into or relied upon or used for the policy-making process, the tort process, and the like. And I think it's fair to say, and I don't want to, to, to uh, uh, give away any of what, what uh, you will hear from Wendy and Tom, but, but the, pi the picture they paint is certainly one that's not pretty and one uh, that should concern us. Uh, I'm going to very briefly introduce our speakers because they have a lot of interesting and substantive things to say, and, and you're here to hear them not to hear me. Uh, first up uh, is going to be Wendy Wagner, who's one of my colleagues here on the faculty at Case Western Reserve University School of Law. She is also uh, the Joe A. Warsham Centennial Professor at the University of Texas School of Law. And we are very fortunate uh, that through a series of events, she has been able to rejoin us here at Case uh, for at least uh, half of her time. Uh, previously, she's been a visiting professor at Columbia and Vanderbilt. Uh, she has a master's in environmental studies from Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, clerked on the Sixth Circuit, has written a, a wide range of, of articles that are, are too numerous to mention, uh, one of which, uh, the, the, uh, if I remember the title correctly, the toxic, uh, or the science trade and toxic risk regulation is, is certainly one of the most important uh, articles written on that subject. Uh, her co-author, uh, Thomas McGarity, who will be here, uh, uh, we, we hope very, very shortly, is the R. and Teresa Lanzano Long Endowed Chair in Administrative Law at the University of Texas School of Law, uh, also a very prolific writer, also has another book about to come out uh, from Yale University Press, The Preemption War, When Federal Bureaucracies Trump Local Juries, uh, and among many other things, uh, was an attorney advisor uh, at the Office of General Counsel at the US EPA. Uh, commenting on uh, Tom and Wendy's book, we have two uh, very distinguished and very knowledgeable uh, commentators that I think we're very lucky to have with us today. Uh, commenting first is going to be Christopher Schrader, who is a director of, who is Charles S. Murphy Professor of Law and Public Policy Studies at Duke University School of Law, as well as the director of the program in public law at Duke. Uh, among other, many other things, uh, he was uh, acting assistant attorney general in the Office of Legal Counsel uh, in the Justice Department uh, during the Clinton administration, and is also co-author of what I believe is still the best-selling environmental law casebook, uh, Environmental Regulation, Law, Science, and Policy. Uh, also commenting uh, will be E. Donald Elliott, who is chair of the Worldwide Environmental Health and Safety Department at the law firm of Wilkie, Farr, and Gallagher in their Washington, D.C. office, uh, but was also previously a um, member of the Yale Law Faculty, a tenured professor there for 12 years, in addition to having been general counsel of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency in the first Bush administration. Uh, so I think we have a fabulous program for you. Uh, Wendy is going to begin uh, giving you a brief overview of the book. We will then get commentary uh, from Chris and Don, and then open it up to questions. And uh, after uh, the event, uh, we will have a brief reception uh, in the lower rotunda on the other side of this wall. So without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Wendy. Great, thanks. I'm pitching for my co-author, um, Tom. He was supposed to present, so instead you got me. I apologize for that, but I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, I first want to uh, give some thanks to Jonathan for putting this together. It was extremely nice to have an event like this, um, and also, Terrific thanks to the two commenters. Not only did they uh, read the book, which I have to say is no small feat, uh, but they also actually got on a plane and flew out here and left much warmer climates to come to cold Cleveland and, and offer comments. And as I understand it, actually are all writing something up. So that's uh, true collegial love that they're showing for us. And, and we really appreciate it, no matter what you have to say about, <laughs> about what, what, we, what we have to say. Uh, so, as Jonathan indicated, my job is to very briefly set up the book, and that's what we'll be sort of critiquing and hashing out through the rest of the time. So hopefully I'll give you the bare bones, enough to know what we're talking about. And before I get into the book itself and its argument, just to put a little history behind the issue, um, probably starting in the 1990s, uh, there was increasing concern about the quality of the science that was being used for public policy. And maybe the, the, uh, the one sort of event that kicked it off was Peter Huber's Galileo's Revenge. It's a book published about how the courts were using junk science. And a lot of jury verdicts actually were probably unreliable because the courts were being so generous with admitting a lot of this bad stuff in. 
And basically the same allegations started carrying over to the agency. That the agencies, particularly the public health and regulatory agencies, also were using junk science or science that wasn't sound and a lot of the resulting regulations that they were promulgating therefore were pretty much unreliable. So this is basically the debate we're jumping into and we're saying, you know, that kind of focus actually misses a larger problem that's beneath it. The problem isn't so much how the agencies or even the courts are producing or using information. The problem is the special interests that are involved in extensive manipulation and corruption of a lot of the information that forms a basis for this decision. Now that's not to say these other concerns are misplaced or there's not other issues going on, but the more we look at the issues going on with the quality of science used for pu public policy, the more we see a significant share of the blame lies at the feet of all the special interest manipulation that goes on with the quality um, and even in the existence of this science and making sure we have the best available science. So the book focuses on this general argument. I'm gonna go through three basic uh, components of our argument. First, you know, what is it about this particular area that leads to this kind of special interest uh, engagement in science that works not only to the legal institution's detriment but also to the scientists themselves. Take you through a couple examples of exactly what I'm talking about, what's actually going on, and then close with uh, some proposals for reform, at least sort of first level proposals, not at all suggesting that that's uh, going to solve everything. So, uh, you know, what is it about this particular area that creates a lot of problems? First to back up, our book is only about public health and environmental research. We talk about special interest manipulation of that body of research. Now, our arguments may apply equally well to other places, uh, to, to economics, to other areas of social science, to other areas of natural science, even to criminal forensic evidence. This is our area of expertise, public health and environment, that's where we focus. So we focus on that particular area of research, and actually that type of research, most of the research used for public policy, and here I'm talking about agencies, rulemakings, and also courts, is very applied. Most of it is applied at a very weak and scientifically vulnerable level. What I mean by this is we actually don't have a lot of scientific theories that explain how pesticides affect animals in the field or how they affect ecosystem function. A lot of times we don't even have scientific mechanistic theories for how cancer develops or not robust theories. As a result of a lot of this applied research is really trial and error. You know, it's shooting a mouse with some stuff and seeing what happens to the mouse. So it's weak science. It's very vulnerable, in other words, to differences on how you do the methods, what the results actually are. At the same time, a lot of this research actually isn't interesting so much to mainstream scientists. The ones in academic institutions trying to get tenure really aren't terribly fascinated by a publication on how a particular type of pesticide affected a specific type of animal in the field. These are very narrow studies, and again, because of their trial and error in nature, they just don't get a lot of scientific oversight. So this stuff is weak methodologically, weak theoretically, and also their scientists aren't terribly engaged in overseeing the quality of this stuff. Um, at the same time, the same applied research in public health and environment is extremely important to some interests. A lot rides on the findings of this research. A lot of dollars, a lot of dollars can be pinned to the research of a single study, for example, linking a toxicant to particular adverse effects. So there's a, 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 hor a horrible cost associated with research that all of a sudden discovers that asbestos is leading to lung cancer or that secondhand smoke is leading to lung cancer in people that are exposed. A lot of money rides on those kinds of findings, and as a result, special interests have a very strong interest in what the results are. Uh, they want to make sure that the research that is being done is being done correctly, particularly when it comes out adversely, and they think they're going to be paying big liability judgments or seeing a lot of expensive regulation. But sometimes they go beyond that. Not only do they want the research to be of the highest quality, but they may actually want to manipulate it a little bit. They may want to produce research that suits their ends or attack research that's actually pretty legitimate that cuts against them. So there's a lot associated with this research. You put these two things combined, very weak, sort of vulnerable, applied research in an in a institutional pressure cooker where so much rides on it and you really have a recipe for some significant problems and specific types of manipulation. So in the book, we talk about this specific type of problem and then the types of things that happen to it. So we actually commissioned a cartoon. The book has 200 very dense pages on all the different ways that this kind of applied science has been 
manipulated by special interests. Now, when we're looking at the manipulation, we're not just talking about funding studies and then backing off. We're talking specifically about sponsors that decide what kind of results they need or how they want those scientific findings to appear and then work backwards to make sure they get that kind of a result in the scientific literature some, somehow. So it's a very sort of narrow, easy identifiable problem in science. We find out, oh, these aren't very focused. Is that my problem? Oh, that's okay. You can't read them anyway. Even if they were focused, I promise you, you couldn't read it. But basically, each chapter looks at different tools, different ways that science can be manipulated and distorted, and, and looks at different sub-tools within these techniques for how it's distorted. And in about 90% of the cases, you can't read it, but in 90% of those cases, it's basically being manipulated or corrupted using legal tools that are available. So it's do, being done not in spite of the legal system so much, but because of it. The legal system is providing the tools that sort of enable this kind of manipulation. It's enabling it through permissive subpoena powers, through permissive scientific misconduct proceedings, through a variety of techniques I'll show you. So a lot of our aim is actually taking at the legal system and how it permits a lot of this stuff to go on. So to give you a few examples of the evidence, and these are, are very few, um, one technique to manipulate science is pretty straightforward, is to commission science, decide what you want that particular research to say about your pharmaceutical drug or about your particular pesticide or whatever the case may be, and you find scientists using contracts, non-disclosure contracts, to make sure that they produce the result that gets your finding. And they, in turn, or with the help of the sponsor, can manipulate the design, uh, data collection, all varieties of features of the scientific process to make sure that they kind of get the results that are close to what they need. Uh, lots of examples of this. We have about 40 pages of examples. Um, just to give you one of my favorites, one of the, the more blatant ones, but it, it's, it's cute. Um, ephedra, a weight loss pill. So in this case, they really wanted to show how effective ephedra was, the manufacturers of ephedra. And so they commissioned a study, a clinical trial with humans, um, to try out ephedra and see if they lost weight over a period of time. Well, when they enrolled the patients, they had a, a handful of obese patients or people admitted into the clinical trial that were trying ephedra, as well as a lot of other weight ranges. Through the course of the clinical trial, a number of the obese people actually dropped out, said, I don't want to do this anymore. But when they were actually calculating the weights to determine the effectiveness of FEDRA, they took the intake weights, which included about six obese people, and then they calculated the outtake weights, which excluded the obese people because they were no longer in the trial. And ephedra looks so incredibly effective in terms of its weight loss, you know, uh, much more effective in, in, than it was. Now, that's a blatant example, although I think actually that study was published and it just wasn't caught in peer review. It was one of those sort of sinister, devious tricks. You know, the peer reviews wouldn't even look, know to look for. Those kind of tricks, though, are easier to do than you might imagine. And the lower you go into the design of the study, the more you can manipulate things in, in pretty clever ways. Now, the funding effect is actually a statistical effort to find not only ends-oriented studies, but actually the effect of sponsor bias in general. Um, the funding effect has been actually published in several journals or, or uh, occurrences of the funding effect or findings of the funding effect. This is one uh, particularly well-known one that was published in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, about six years ago. Basically, they did a meta-analysis on over 1,000 biomedical studies. And they found that when a sponsor sponsored the research, and we're not sure what the contractual relationships were, so it's probably different kinds of sponsorship control, but when a sponsor sponsored the research, there was a statistically significant powerful correlation between the outcome of that study and sponsor control. When a sponsor controlled it, it was to the right of the line. The results were much more statistically likely to be in favor of the sponsor. Um, when the sponsor didn't fund it, they were more in the middle on the line. So the funding effects also suggest that even just at the level of financing, there's powerful correlations. So another way to manipulate science beyond actually commissioning the research to get what you want is uh, to suppress or hide the stuff that you do commission that you don't want after all. Using contract law and typical non-disclosure contracts usually can at least scare the scientists into not producing this. I have up on the board some of the poster children of suppression, you know, asbestos, all these incidences actually were exposed through tort litigation. Uh, pretty dedicated, determined plaintiff attorneys that were determined to find these smoking gun documents. And actually most of the suppression we've learned about in public health and environmental law has come from tort law, 
not from agency regulators, and increasingly there's a concern that even in tort law, some of this information may not be coming to the fore. Um, defendants can actually sometimes convince plaintiffs to accept a bonus payment if they seal the records and seal all the documents that were discovered um, in, during discovery, including these smoking gun suppression documents. So there's some evidence, in some cases at least, that some of this was actually uncovered by plaintiff attorneys maybe five or six years before, but it was sealed um, because the plaintiffs accepted a bonus payment. It's only that final plaintiff that won't accept the bonus payment where the information actually hits the light of day. Okay, in another attack. Um, this one I love. I actually love the last two because they're so despicable and disgusting, and I'm really into that stuff, um, as my students know. Um, this is, a, this is a technique that's so clever that it's beautiful. Um, this was actually, uh, I would say we should uh, give uh, um, intellectual property rights to the tobacco industry for coming up with this. And this is the idea that when you have credible research out there and you don't want it, and you know it's really adverse to your economic interests, it's really ugly for your future, you throw sand in it, as much sand as you possibly can. You critique the hell out of it is exactly what you do. Um, and so for the tobacco industry, the research showing that tobacco caused cancer um, led to commissioned critiques uh, that were determined, that were specifically, had the purpose specifically of trying to show that those studies had numerous flaws and shouldn't be trusted. When research came out with secondhand smoke, the same kind of barrage of criticism uh, went out and actually hit the media as legitimate problems with this research on secondhand smoke causing cancer. Um, so it's a very clever technique, and why it's so clever is because vigorous skepticism, actually heavily vetting science, is a principle of science. In fact, that's a, a scientific norm. Scientists cherish the ability to vigorously debate and engage in skepticism. And so camouflaging these critiques and attacks as legitimate efforts to be skeptical really makes them look good, but they're different. They're different because in this case, we have a sponsor who hires people to do nothing but poke holes in studies. It's not an academic researcher saying, this study's really bad, I need to write a letter to the editor. This is not the kind of thing that should be called science. These instead are paid for critiques where they're poking at every single feature of the study, including many, stud many features that scientists themselves might find perfectly acceptable or methodologically within range. Um, but the effect is for public policymakers to see these studies where there's 20, 30 problems with them, even though scientists would find most of those problems to be trivial um, and even contestable, and it basically disparages the study. Another technique um, that kind of goes along hand in hand with attacking the science is going after the researchers themselves. Now, this is used rarely, but when it is used, it is truly despicable. So in this case, what you do is you take a researcher who's coming out with very important discoveries that are adverse to your interest, and you go after them. You go after them with legal tools. And you do this not only to harass and intimidate them, um, but to make disparage the reputation so people don't view them as good scientists. Uh, we have about 35 pages on the techniques of this. Just to point one out, Paul Fisher, uh, the second guy, his research um, looked at Joe Camel. Do, you, do any of you remember Joe Camel? Just adorable little camel. Um, and he actually looked at how children reacted to Joe Camel. And he found that kids like Joe Camel better than any other childhood icon. They liked him better than Ronald McDonald, Bozo the Clown, even my favorite Mary Poppins. You know, Joe Camel was at the top of the list. He published this in JAMA, a very reputable empirical study. But this was not something R.J. R. Reynolds was uh, happy with. It suggested that they were actually trying to engage children in liking cigarettes. So what did they do? In unrelated litigation, they filed a third-party subpoena against all the records in his lab, including the confidential records of the children's addresses, names, phone numbers, the whole ball of wax. Now, this is a subpoena um, power that is provided by federal law, res uh, giving a third-party subpoena to, to researchers whose research has some relevance to the litigation. But the federal court caught on real quickly. They quashed the subpoena, said, you've got to be kidding. You can't do this. Um, and so then R.J. Reynolds went to state court, and they actually convinced a state court to require him to release all these records, including the confidential records, under the State Information, a Freedom of Information Act, because he was at a public medical college. After this experience, he also had scientific misconduct allegations filed against him by people that were paid for by the tobacco industry. After this, um, he left 
his tenured post. He had tenure um, and now practices internal medicine in rural Georgia. So at least they, they didn't succeed in killing his research, but they did succeed in killing his, his research career. Um, so you can use these tools quite powerfully. And again, these are tools uh, that are coming from the legal system. And in fact, our, our criticism really is leveled against this very permissive legal system. In most of these cases, the legal system is doing surprisingly little to anticipate or to counteract these effects. So for example, agencies don't require um, when they get the research in to help them understand the safety of a pesticide or a chemical, they don't even require disclosures of what role the sponsor played in that particular research. They don't require simple things that biomedical journals all require, just as a condition to understand the research used for regulation. Um, we do federally have a law that requires data sharing, that when you produce a, uh, a piece of research that informs regulatory um, decision making, that you have to make that data available. But that requirement only applies to federal research. It doesn't apply to private research, even when that pr private research informs regulatory decisions. We have very poor requirements on, on um, requiring companies to report adverse effects that they discover in their products over time. Most of these requirements are essentially unenforceable. And a lot of the legal tools I've, I've talked about, sometimes you can't use them in the end, um, but there's very few sanctions for abusing it. There's very few sanctions for kind of pushing the envelope and trying. So surprisingly passive legal systems that lets all of this stuff go on. So what do we do? Um, well, we have three sets of reforms, and actually, because it's such a depressing, seemingly pervasive problem, um, we understand that these reforms are just the tip of the iceberg and what we call the low-hanging fruit. But they're an effort to kind of start to engage in the problem and get the legal system engaged. So the first set of reforms actually suggests that the scientific community and actually scientific journals have a lot of requirements in place that could be codified into regulatory law. Biomedical journals require you to tell how much the, the, the sponsor controlled your research or whether your research was ghostwritten. Biomedical journals also expect you to share your data that underlies uh, your published studies. So just codify these. These are mandatory regulatory requirements, or they should be, we argue. Um, also, much stronger adverse reporting requirements. So maybe even plaintiff attorneys who are involved in lawsuits where they're sealing suppressed evidence may have a reporting obligation that can actually be civilly fine, so to broaden and expand requirements for reporting for adverse effects. A second set of reforms actually looks at the abuse of legal process and says we need to create some sort of sanctions for this. You know, if you're abusing subpoena power or filing scientific misconduct uh, charges without a lot of basis for it, there need to be some consequences to that besides simply losing that charge because you've tainted a reputation. So we call for more sanctions for abuse of process and maybe all, also more mechanisms for other parties beyond the government to start to police the quality of this regulatory science. We have pretty specific, somewhat tedious suggestions for broadening the number of tort claims that are available, including providing scientists who have been harassed themselves potentially some sort of tort remedy for that kind of harassment. Those are difficult reforms, though. They walk a bit of a tightrope um, because we don't want to all of a sudden create too many remedies for harassment because those could be used by scientists that actually have done terrible things, and then they can file that claim against people who uh, uh, make disparaging comments about their research that are, in fact, justified, and then they can say they're harassed. So it's a very difficult thing to solve, but we try to come up with some suggestions. The third set of reforms, which sounds like throwing it in the towel, but I don't think it is throwing in the towel, is to suggest that you know, we need to rethink our use of science when we develop public policy. I think a lawyer's automatic response is science will solve this, let's reach for science, let's base everything on science. And if the applied science is gonna go through this kind of hell, then perhaps we need to try to use it only when we absolutely have to. If we can't make public policy on a particular issue without using the science, then we have to go through this process of figuring out how to discipline it so we get credible science appearing. But if there's another way to engage in public health protection that doesn't involve so much intensive science, then perhaps we should do that. Um, I have on the, uh, the, the board here a couple pictures of, of pollution outfalls. And in fact, um, all, almost all of our environmental statutes actually require industry simply to implement the best available pollution control technologies, which essentially doesn't require all the scientific knowledge about the environment. It kind of circumvents a lot of these problems because it's an engineering issue. So we ask for people to be a little bit more guarded about about their sort of automatic reliance on science. So with that, I'll open it up to our distinguished commenters. Um, and I don't know, do we have an order? Yes, Chris. Okay. And should I just try to make this disappear? Yeah, if you can figure out so that we don't have to have, although we could, yeah.
Nope, one more. There we go. Well, thank you very much. Thanks to Jonathan for inviting me and for Wendy and Tom for writing such a terrific book. It's a pleasure to be here to talk about it this afternoon. My first inclination after reading it a couple of times was just to get up for 15 minutes and gush about it, about how much I like it. But That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but within the cultural norms of this strange academic tribe, uh, that's inappropriate behavior at one of these sessions. So. Instead, I will uh, try to um, shed, I'm, I'm not going to be terribly critical of anything of, about it because, as I say, there's much, much to commend and very little even to question. I, I thought I had a list of objections the first time through, and then I went back and read it again and I said, nope, they've answered that. They figured out how to qualify it there. So um, I do want to make some remarks that, that, um, that frame the problem in a, in a perspective that um, uh, may shed a little uh, additional light on the problem that they've identified in a terrifically researched and uh, splendidly written um, contribution that I think that people are going to be referring to for a long time when, when being concerned about, um, about bent science. So let's start just by reiterating that definition of what, what their target is. Bent science, they say on page uh, 45, consists of ends-oriented research and critiques of research that work backward from a result, and for that reason, not true science. And then a little later on, they actually say it's the antithesis of science. Bent science is having a result in mind and working back to get that result out of something that superficially looks like science, but is making the mistake along the way of being driven by the result and not driven by anything having to do with scientific methodology and technique, which at some point, in order to be science, has to sort of be let loose to roam and come to an endpoint that's driven by the methodologies. Now, the methodologies may be disputable. There may be more than one. Uh, it may be contestable, which is the superior one to use. And in lots of these areas of policy-relevant science, there is to reason to dispute and question. But if it's going to be science at some point, the method has to be able to roam free. And the idea behind bent science is that the um, undertaking is constantly being guided by the importance of ratifying a result that you've already reached. And so the book is filled with these alarming studies, some of which Wendy has, has uh, recited. And, and there, I can assure you the book is, is rewarding in, in the sense that there are many, many more case studies throughout the, the, uh, the chapters that identify the problem um, of science being bent. And your first reaction, my first reaction, is these, these studies are utterly alarming. And then my second reaction is more or less the same as uh, the chief inspector in Casablanca when, when Rick's casino is being closed down. Um, shocking that there's uh, gambling going on in this place. <laughs> because from a larger perspective, it would perhaps be even more alarming if you didn't, on a hard look, hello, Tom. Hello, Welcome. Tom? <laughs> Just to bring you up to speed, I've just spent the last couple of minutes blaming you for anything that's wrong oh, about the book. I could get all the blame. If we did this at Texas, it, I'd have more problem, but this is Wendy's home, right. home right. turf. It would be alarming if you didn't find uh, at least a certain uh, number of instances of this behavior. And so one question that seems unanswerable to me is how far we've progressed above that uh, level that you might expect uh, to have occurred anyway, just how deep and serious is this problem? And, and they um, in candidly uh, admit there's really very little way to tell. They're, they're, they've certainly well documented the cases they discuss. But is this the tip of the iceberg or is this the iceberg? Well, it's probably neither one. Uh, it, there's probably something under the water there. We just don't know what the size of the problem is. But I think there are four conditions that contribute to the, to the Rick's Casino um, sort of reaction being the proper one to this problem. One, as Wendy says, one, one element of th that environment is that increasingly uh, 
uh, public decisions um, and public decision makers are asking science to provide the factual predicate for public policy decisions that have significant economic consequences to well-organized groups, firms, organizations. The first regulatory agency for uh, occupational and public uh, safety was the, uh, was the Federal Steamboat Boiler Commission, which was established in order to, to create some common standards for the boilers that went on to steamships. And um, it was an easy problem to identify, and then it turned out to be relatively simple to write some regulations for standards. Uh, utterly obvious when a boiler blows up. <laughs> uh, doesn't take a lot of tricky risk assessment or regression analysis to tell you that that's the problem. But when you've moved into a world in which uh, carcinogens have latency periods of uh, 20 years, in which the demand of the public for new medicines is such that you could never run in advance of marketing sufficient safety studies in order to, to, uh, to demonstrate what the magnitude of risk associated with a drug that uh, you've concluded is effective is going to be, you're in the realm of uh, risk management and risk analysis, and you're going to be looking to, to, to scientific techniques to give you some handle on the magnitude of those problems in an effort to help you make your judgments. So we're in an area in which public decisions increasingly rely upon the kind of information that is being bent in uh, Wendy and Tom's book. The second ingredient that creates an environment for this kind of behavior is uh, one, of the, one of the seminal lessons of the school of thought called public choice theory, uh, with which I have some significant problems in some of its aspects. But I think it's absolutely dead on in, uh, in, in insisting that we recognize that at least a good percentage of the time, individuals tend to be goal-oriented. The goal tends to be self-interested. And people are capable of doing reverse engineering. They're capable of reasoning back from a result to, to figure out what move I need to make at step one so that things turn out OK at step three. Um, now, what public choice is relentless about is insisting that you ought to be alert for that behavior everywhere, <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> Whether it's the decision to get married or the decision about bending science or the decision about whether to merge with, a, with another company in a, in a rapidly developing market, you ought to be alert to the fact that one of the strong motivations uh, is goal-oriented, self-interested behavior. Now, at one point in time, we like to think that there were a set of jobs that were relatively immune from this kind of pressure. We call them professions to distinguish them from jobs. And anybody who's worked in the legal business, in, 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 uh, in, in the real legal business, the kind of legal business Don does, and the kind um, many people in this room, I'm sure, have had some experience with, you know how much the law, legal profession has become a recognizably a big business today, and firms need to be run sharply with an eye to the bottom line. When I first went to a law firm in San Francisco in the early 70s, they liked to say we were one happy family, uh, work hard for us and you can have a job forever, the kind of thing that General Motors used to say to its employees. Now, of course, the, the mantra around most firms is you eat what you kill. So things have changed. Science is often considered, or medicine, uh, often considered uh, um, immune from these kinds of pressures. But of course, those are ideal types, and, and there certainly are many scientists and many doctors who are relatively immune to the pressure, but there are many who succumb for one reason or another, particularly if the, the dollar sign uh, becomes large, large enough. And as Wendy says, uh, and Wendy and Tom say so well in the book, that what we're really talking about with respect to, to policy-relevant science is, is from the point of view of a first-class, cutting-edge researcher, pretty pedestrian stuff. So you're going to get people involved or ready to be involved in uh, the lucrative side of this um, sort of activity, po producing policy-relevant science, who might, uh, statistically speaking, have, uh, on average, fewer scruples about this kind of behavior than the folks who are uh, angling for a Nobel Prize, which is harder to uh, 
harder to achieve if you've had significant um, problems with your scientific research and the credibility of your research in the past. The, um, so what it was, so I don't want to be a critic of self-interest. Self-interest is an extraordinary engine of entrepreneurship and growth and innovation and creativity and the idea that you can marshal people's self-interest in order to, to, to develop better science or, or do better medicine or create small jobs and small businesses is a vital part of our socioeconomic structure. The, the ideal is whether you, is, is can you marshal that self-interest? Can, can you get people who are self-interested to play within the lines, to abide by the rules of the game? Um, we, li we like to think that um, we can, but it's a relentless struggle. And I think that what, they've, what they have documented so well in the book is with, with respect to bent science, we haven't yet thought about hard enough about how you get to pe people to play within the lines. And I think there are two conditions here that, that – uh, that make, um, make going outside the lines particularly tempting, beyond the, the, the ones I've mentioned already. The, the first uh, additional condition is that it's often hard to tell bent science from straight science. Because oftentimes you need to get inside the head of the researcher and, and figure out, is he or she engaged in reverse engineering or does this eureka just happen to be a result that uh, is very beneficial to uh, Merck or to, uh, or to Dow Chemical? Um, now, they have done an excellent job mining the literature and doing their own original research to demonstrate quite convincingly that in a number of cases, ex post, you can peel back the story and become fairly reliably convinced that bent science is what you're confronting. But ex ante, this is a very hard problem to figure out how to police. And you've got a situation in which uh, what the economists call asymmetric information. The, 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 the scientist knows <laughs> what his or her motivations are, but the person who's reviewing the science doesn't. And so it's going to be difficult to, uh, to detect. And then the last condition that generates the environment for this sort of problem is that a number of a number of problems with bent science, or, or what the book identifies with bent science, it's not exactly clear where the line is, <laughs> and, and whether, whether somebody's playing inside of it or outside of it. So for those who haven't read the, the book, um, I'd, I'd make a recommendation that as you go through it, in addition to the, to the typology that they present of the techniques for bending science, that is shaping it, hiding it, attacking, um, harassing, packaging, or spinning science, you ask yourself as you're going through the case studies, is this a case uh, in which it's clear that somebody stepped outside the line and what we have is an enforcement problem, or is this a case where the line is fuzzy? So I think you'd need different remedial techniques to deal with those two problems. Let me just give you some quick examples, um, what, what would be on my matrix, uh, just a couple of examples. They give an example on page 68 of Dr. Walsh, a, a distinguished researcher at the NIH who uh, was a world expert in, uh, in treatment of fungal diseases. And um, the FDA faced a situation of uh, a proposal to, um, that they approve a drug that would be um, a marketed substitute or alternative to what is, was then the benchmark drug for treating a certain kind of uh, fungal disease, the problem with the benchmark drug that was out there is it had some nasty side effects, including it could kill you. So the idea was you could make a lot of money if you could come up with a substitute that was pretty near as effective as the benchmark and didn't have these nasty side effects. But how do you decide to run a comparative effectiveness test? Well, you've got to have two study groups, one in the condition of being given the benchmark and the other in the condition of being given um, the, um, the, the candidate new drug. But what dose? What dose do you apply? Pick the apply too light a dose on the, on the uh, benchmark drug and, and it will show a relatively low level of effectiveness. Of course, drive the dose up and you begin killing more people. But there's a range in there where there's some discretion about what, what level of dose should you use for the benchmark and then the drug manufacturer has a suggested recommended dose for, for their new product. Well, well, Walsh, it turns out, after the fact, is getting a lot of money from pharmaceutical companies that are in the business of applying for FDA 
new drug approval, and he recommends a dose that either is on the very low end of therapeutic for the, for the, uh, for the existing drug or maybe even below it. In any event, there are a considerable number of people after the fact who think that the dose for the benchmark drug should have been much higher than was used in the test. But, but in large part because a low dose was used, the trial drug turns out to look pretty good in an effectiveness comparison against the low dose. Walsh is eventually found out. He's accused of uh, unethical, unpro unprofessional behavior, of violating NIH regulations. And by a quirk of the civil service rules, he can't be directly disciplined by the NIH, but they recommend that he be additioned by the, um, uh, sanctioned by the Public Health Commission Corps. I don't know whether there's an after story as to whether or not they actually went through with that. But I would call that a case of pretty clear Dr. Walsh is operating outside the lines. Take another example, this one of um, the efforts by the chrome industry to do some studies to try to head off uh, further regulation of chromium in the workplace. And so they do some studies of two plants in the United States and two plants in Germany. Don't like the results that come out when you combine the data, but they discover that if you separate the plants by those geographic locations, you can produce two results, one which shows no statistically significant impact from chromium at the level of exposure, and the other that shows impact only at the very highest levels of exposure. So they published the disaggregated results instead of the overall results. Well, epidemiologists have a word for this kind of activity, a phrase. They call it lumping and splitting. You take data, you lump it, you split it, you can massage it to mean a lot of different things. We've all heard statistics, lies, damn lies, and statistics. Well, a lot of epidemiologists will tell you that epidemiology is a way of describing an undifferentiated mass of data by using statistical methods to give you some uh, descriptors for the significance of that information. So you can divide it in half, you can lop, lomp it together, you can, divide, you can slice it by time, you can do lots of different things with it, and there's often under the circumstances no clear-cut canonical version of the absolute correct way to do this because you're, there are an infinite number of ways that, that information can be described. The, the, you know, the story of the four blind men in, in the room trying to describe an elephant. They've all got valid descriptions of something that could yet be described in dozens of other ways. And epidemiology is, is one of those, uh, those professions that's like that, that, that has a lot of different statistical tools for describing data. And uh, it's not at all clear had they chosen the disaggregated approach ex ante, that you would see a problem in that. The fact that they've done it ex post, <laughs> the fact that they've found out, I don't like that description, let me give you another description, sounds pretty bad. It's also exactly the thing that lawyers do all the time with cases. <laughs> um, so that's a little harder problem. Where is the line there in that kind of, uh, they haven't manipulated the, the raw data, the, the raw data they accept but they've manipulated the characterization of it. That's a little trickier problem. Another tricky problem is in the examples they give in their, their chapter in spinning science. Again, the idea that you're using public relations firms in the kind of aggressive and often distorting and, and uh, unethical ways that they describe in, in the book, um, I think are, all, to my mind, are uh, relatively clear-cut cases. Um, but the proposition that it is, uh, there's a line to be crossed in the way a firm that's got a lot of uh, self-interest wrapped up in a scientific de decision frames a message or characterizes a message is a tricky line to figure out. Um, where I come from, the easy example of this is the Duke lacrosse case, which may be familiar to some of you in this room. It certainly is familiar to anybody who lives within 100 miles of Duke University. That incident in which a bunch of our lacrosse students were found in a, in a party and uh, an accusation was made by the exotic dancer who was at the party that she had been sexually assaulted by three members of the Duke lacrosse team, um, black uh, exotic dancer, uh, from the poor part of town, uh, wealthy white university, fairly wealthy lacrosse families, um, 
aggressive sexual behavior, drunkenness involved, had all of the um, hallmarks of a public relations disaster for Duke University, and it was. <laughs> now, if you talk to the leadership of Duke, one of the things you'll hear often from them is we should have had a good crisis management firm <laughs> come in who really understood how to get on top of this story so that we could get our story out. So the feeling was that our story had just been buried by the fact that the district attorney gave 71 interviews within the first week, went on TV, was excoriating, was, ind was indicting, trying, and convicting these three students in front of the camera. He's since been disciplined, filed for bankruptcy. The world has ended for Mike Nifong as far as that goes. But you can't, the, the truth never catches up with a lie in those kinds of situations. And Duke, I think, it's fair to say, would have been a lot better off if it, instead of doing what it did, which was to say, let's back off, let the criminal justice system play out the way uh, it will eventually. That's where due process is going to be played out. If they had kind of tried to aggressively frame the story in a way that's complicated, but you could figure out how to do, they would have been much better off. Well, one way of saying that is Duke didn't spin the story for Duke University. Is if they had spun the story, are they on a are they on a the wrong side or the right side of a line. Um, I think you confront some of the same problems with respect to some of the circumstances um, in which companies who have a big stake in a science outcome, the science is at least somewhat up for grabs, decide that they're going to be aggressive about representing their point of view on what the right science answer is. Now, at some point, this becomes bent science. I mean, Tom's done a lot of work on tobacco, and tobacco is the classic case of there now being fairly good evidence that in the boardrooms of the tobacco companies, they knew exactly what they were doing, which is they weren't telling the truth <laughs> about their product. Other situations are going to be a little bit, they're going to be in more of a gray area, where there's some evidence some way, some evidence the other way. The weight of the evidence seems to be going against you, but it's not all the way against you. Uh, doubt is our product is the tobacco mantra of which they continued <laughs> well beyond they had any doubt. <laughs> but, you know, one of the hallmarks of an entrepreneur is they're very optimistic <laughs> about their potential for success and about the bona fides of their product. And it's often hard to persuade somebody who's about to lose a lot of money <laughs> if the evidence is still contested that they just ought to give up <laughs> and not, and not uh, challenge the public perceptions in, in the strongest way possible. Spinning is most effective when you're dealing with an issue that involves the legislature or public perceptions, less effective when you're doing work before administrative agencies and juries. So there's a, another typology you could develop in terms of these techniques. Um, but it's also an area, I think, that in, which, in which the line is, is uh, particularly fuzzy. And then, of course, you have little nasty problems like the First Amendment to worry about if you want to develop some strong rules for regulating the way people try to frame messages. I got a little bit to say about remedies, but I've already taken too long, so I'm going to stop with that kind of uh, set of introductory remarks and let uh, Don take over, and then we can do something more in questions. Thank you. Well, I, I knew I made a serious mistake when they asked me if I cared in what order we went, because. Uh, Chris made a number of uh, really excellent points uh, and that uh, I had hoped to make. Um, uh, I, I even had the, uh, the Casablanca uh, line in mind, <laughs> so I'm not going to use that. But I, I do think uh, Chris has, has put his finger on a, a couple of the key issues, and, and one of them is this line drawing problem in terms of uh, whether or not there are uh, le legitimate uh, uses of what I'll, what I'll call advocacy uh, science. But let me, let me start out by saying um, this is an excellent book. Uh, it's one of the best books uh, to be written in the law and science area in many decades. Um, it's a perfect Christmas gift, and I, <laughs> I recommend that you all uh, buy it and, and read it. I um, plan to use it. <laughs> <laughs> It's, 
It's, uh, it's, it's original. Uh, an awful lot of what's been written in the law and science area for the last 40 years has all been derivative of C.P. Snow's The Two Cultures Problem. This is, uh, this is a very original. Uh, it, deals with a, it deals with a very real problem. It makes, uh, it makes uh, apparent uh, what is a, a very significant problem in the legal system, particularly the regulatory side. And I, I think it's very readable. It's very well researched. And I'm in general agreement with uh, most of the remedies that they, uh, they talk about. Uh, certainly, um, there's a great need for disclosure. Um, I, Wendy, in, in an article in, in Science in 2003 with David Michaels, has proposed some really strong uh, mechanisms for uh, disclosure of interest and bias in, in regulatory science, and I certainly agree with that. Uh, I've been a long advocate of more use of, of neutral consensus panels and other of their recommendations. I, I think that's a good idea. Um, they mentioned codes of conduct, and I think that that really has to do with the line drawing problem, and I think that maybe is a part of it that's a little bit underdeveloped, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about what I think we ought to do in that area. Uh, I also agree with uh, their idea uh, that uh, we should have some remedies for harassing scientists. Uh, Abusive discovery is a, a general problem, but I, I'm glad to see that they're supporting some remedies there. I, I'm not as um, uh, uh, on board with the notion of forging ahead without sound science, as they say on page 282. That does, that does seem to me a little bit like throwing in the towel, but, but uh, I, I've been a longtime supporter of technology-based standards. I was general counsel of EPA when we passed the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments that that took Section 112, which had been based on the need for a lot of science, and made it into technology-based. So, you know, if that's all you're talking about, nobody can really disagree with that. But I do think there are, uh, so there's an awful lot to like in the book, uh, and that actually makes it uh, quite hard to be a, a commenter, uh, because uh, you don't want to just uh, uh, praise it. Um, but there's an awful lot in it that's, uh, that's very valuable, and I think that, that they've done uh, a, a great job in terms of making a very real problem apparent. Um, as often happens when somebody deals with a new problem, they get 80 or 90 percent of it right, but they don't get necessarily get it all right uh, the first time around. And I, I do think there are, there are two problems in the, in the book, uh, which uh, it occurs to me are, are perhaps somewhat related in a, in a subtle way. First of all, I think they underestimate the, um, the, 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 the power of, of non-monetary biases. Um, uh, they, uh, and then secondly, uh, and relatedly, I, I think their search for the truly disinterested scientist uh, is, a, is a little bit of a, um, an impossible task. Uh, Reminds me a little bit of Demosthenes, you know, going around with the lantern, ask, looking for the truly honest person, uh, and never, uh, and never, never finding one. Um, there are a number of other institutions that have pursued uh, this uh, issue in the past, um, and I think they don't talk as much as they might about some of the experiences that the National Academy of Sciences has had in dealing with these issues over the uh, over the years. And after many years and a lot of experience, I think for some good and sufficient reasons, the National Academy has given up on the notion that you can find truly disinterested scientists for the panel uh, and has gone instead to the notion of disclosure of biases and trying to balance biases. Um, and I think there's, uh, there's some good learning in that. Um, they attribute a lot of the problem uh, to the notion that scientists, particularly in the regulatory area, are not, quote, disinterested. And they, they flirt a little bit in the book with the notion that, well, maybe we should only allow truly disinterested scientists to, to speak on these issues or that we should base our decisions only on science that's done by, uh, by uh, 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 disinterested parties. Uh, but ultimately, they don't, they don't go there. They, they back off, and they don't really t uh, take that position. And I think for some good reasons. Um, I think most of us think that the First Amendment protects the right to do science, and it also protects the right to, to comment on proposed government uh, decisions. And they also recognize that there would probably be um, insufficient funding um, 
for science, particularly of the sorts that we need in the, in the public policy process, if, uh, if uh, uh, self-interested parties were not, were not contributing to it. So I think that really leads us to the, the kind of line drawing problems that, uh, that, that Chris was, was talking about. Uh, you can't really get rid of uh, uh, self-interest uh, in, in human affairs, at least not in a democracy which has something like our First Amendment. Well, let me talk about those two, uh, two problems and then maybe where I would come out a little bit differently on some issues. Uh, first, um, turning to the one about underestimating the effect of non-economic biases. I think much to their credit, um, they do at least give lip service to the notion uh, that uh, the so-called special interests that they're criticizing are not all corporations. Uh, they say on page 38 that um, all parties who participate in the public policy process are, are guilty, including uh, specifically the, the self-appointed public interest uh, advocates. Uh, but in fact, the overwhelming majority of the examples that they give thereafter are of where corporate interests are corrupting the scientific process uh, through the use of, uh, of money. And they even have one, one passage where they assert uh, that corporations probably do this more uh, than, uh, than other groups for some reasons that they give, but I, I'm not persuaded that they've really made a, made a strong case of that. I think what they underestimate um, is what I've come to call the hedonic fallacy, and that, uh, that really came from an article I read a number of years ago by Milton Friedman um, in a, uh, his introduction to Frederick Hayek's book, The Road to Serfdom, Friedman put a very interesting uh, proposition. He said, since socialism doesn't work, uh, why doesn't it die out? Uh, why do people continue advocating it? Uh, and his answer was, it makes the people who are advocating it feel so good about themselves. Um, and I certainly have had the experience in my lifetime of um, taking a position where I felt I was really saving humanity. Um, and that was a much headier experience for me than um, working for, for, for a dollar. So I, I think that we have, to be, um, uh, we, we have to be sensitive to the possibility that sometimes people are not disinterested uh, for reasons other than uh, monetary reasons. Uh, recently, uh, EPA uh, threw an environmentalist off um, one of its uh, scientific advisory committees because she had testified the day before in a state legislature um, that the chemical that she was going to be considering the next day should be banned. Um, that kind of pre-commitment to an outcome is, is also a, a, a bias. Uh, and I think most of us, as a result of our previous life experiences, um, have various biases. And I think it would be very, very difficult to create a system in which uh, all the people uh, who are uh, allowed to participate are, quote, disinterested. It's actually interesting. Uh, the whole book uh, gives examples of people who are interested in various ways. It doesn't actually give us any uh, uh, examples of the, uh, of the norm on the other side of the truly disinterested scientists. So I'd like to, I'd like to see some examples of uh, you know, who might qualify. But they really, moving to the second point about this focus on being disinterested, um, they, they say that the first norm of science, either creating or reviewing science, uh, is disinterested. And they, and they remark with, uh, with horror that some experts are, are willing to work backward from the outcome in order to uh, advance the interests of the party for whom they are, are working. Uh, that's where I was going to make the Casablanca remark that has already been uh, preempted. Um, I think what's going on there is what's called the fallacy of composition. Um, they are using a very general term, science, to refer to several different um, things um, and thereby sort of muddling them together. Uh, an example would be, an analogy would be, if we were to use the word law, to apply to what judges do, what professors do, and what practicing lawyers or advocates do. We could say, well, they're all doing law, and some of them are, are interested in the outcome because they represent, uh, they represent, uh, they represent clients. 
A number of years ago, Stephen Goldberg at uh, Georgetown Law School wrote a wonderful article in the Georgetown Law Journal um, called Law and Science, The Reluctant Embrace, in which he compared law and science and he predicted in that, uh, in that paper the emergence of what he called science advocates or science counselors. Those are scientifically trained people who do what lawyers do, who, who advocate, who are policy advocates, um, uh, but uh, are do it on a scientifically trained basis. And I think what really sets up the problem that they are talking about in, the, in their book is that we've seen the emergence of this new profession of science advocates, but we really haven't um, developed the appropriate codes of conduct or what Chris Schrader calls the appropriate line drawing as to what are appropriate and inappropriate instances of being science advocates. So I, I do agree with them in terms of the nature of the problem, but I don't agree that the solution uh, is to uh, develop people who are purely disinterested but rather to try to establish the legitimate ground rules or what, uh, or what Chris was talking about in terms of line drawing uh, problems. Now it's sometimes tempting from the luxury of the university or the, or the, uh, or the government to uh, feel superior to uh, poor working stiffs like me uh, who actually have clients uh, who have positions or, or, or interests. Um, and I think that that is in and of itself a kind of bias that only people uh, who, uh, who are disinterested financially in the outcome can really contribute to the uh, process. To me, the issue is whether or not it's possible to be ethical and also to be an advocate. Uh, and as someone who teaches in a law school, still teaches in a law school, um, I feel very strongly about that, uh, that issue, which I think is very analogous to the issue that they're putting in their, uh, in their book. Um, I was asked to give a lecture in Texas, as a matter of fact, a number of years ago about whether or not law was an honorable profession. Um, and I said, no, law is not an honorable profession, but it's possible to be an honorable lawyer. Um, and I think that's a very important distinction. Um, I, I think the fallacy in their book is that they assume that it is impossible to be an ethical science advocate. They insist that the only way that one can be uh, a, an ethical science advocate is if one is, quote, disinterested. And I think that uh, that causes them to perhaps uh, draw the lines in, some wrong, in the wrong places and underemphasize the importance on developing uh, ethical codes and rules for this new emerging profession of uh, science advocacy. So I, I believe that interested science or science advocacy can make a valuable contribution to the regulatory process. But it has to be disciplined, it has to be policed, there have to be uh, codes of disclosure but also codes of conduct as to what is legitimate advocacy and what is not. Let me give you a couple of examples. Um, one point in the book on page 14 uh, they refer to what they call highly sophisticated trickery, such as concealing the provenance of commissioned research or recruiting the best university scientists to uh, critique unwelcome research. Well, in, in that sentence, I think, again, you see the fallacy of composition. Um, I think concealing the provenance of research, that is, concealing that you've been paid to do research, so you're masquerading as if you were a law professor or a judge when you're actually an advocate. I think that's unforgivable. Uh, and I certainly support the a position that they take in this book and that Wendy and, and David Michaels have taken earlier, that when people have been uh, paid as advocates, uh, we have to understand that that's, that's the role they're playing. But the second half of that sentence, that it is somehow highly sophisticated trickery to recruit the best university scientists to critique unwelcome research. There I have some difficulty understanding what is supposedly wrong with, uh, with doing that. Um, are people who are advocates in the regulatory process not supposed to recruit the best scientists? They're supposed to recruit the second best scientists? Are they supposed to critique welcome research, not unwelcome research? Um, are people in universities not supposed to dirty their, their hands by getting involved in something like uh, the, uh, the public policy process? 
So it, it seems to me that there's a, a confusion revealed there um, between uh, whether or not uh, uh, policy should be simply left to those who are disinterested or whether or not there is a, there's a role for people who do have an interest in the process uh, but in terms of establishing what appropriate roles of conduct might, uh, might be. So I strongly would support um, disclosure rules uh, as they do. I also think that doesn't go far enough. I think we need specific codes of conduct as to what is legitimate or, or not legitimate. Um, I don't think that data dredging uh, or, or uh, selective presentation of your data or not disclosing uh, the changes that you've made uh, as a result of uh, a sponsor intervention. I think there should be clearly established codes of conduct that put those kinds of uh, bad practices off limits. Those are, those are like uh, the rule of ethics that we lawyers have in Rule 3.3 .3 of the Rules of Professional Conduct, for example, that it's not ethical to fail to disclose to a court uh, the controlling authority in a, in, a, in a jurisdiction if it hasn't been cited by your advocate. It's not ethical uh, to, um, even as an advocate, uh, to make a misrepresentation of fact to the tribunal. So I, I think that what is going on in this field is we've had the emergence of science advocates, but we haven't developed uh, codes of ethics or policeable rules of conduct as to what is uh, legitimate science advocacy and what is, uh, uh, is illegitimate. And I think you see this in some ways in the, in the book in the sense that um, most of the examples given in the book are examples where one side or the other advocated a flawed position. But in the overwhelming majority of cases, ultimately from the, the clash of these flawed positions, the, the truth emerged. Uh, and it was, uh, it eventually at least came out. Um, that really is the nature of the, uh, uh, of the adversary system. And it does seem to me that's in, that it is inevitable for some of the reasons that they uh, identify that regulatory science is going to involve uh, a clash of interests and will not just be made by uh, disinterested platonic guardians uh, who have no interest in the outcome. Um, so I think the challenge is uh, to come up with um, uh, techniques, rules, limits that police the um, exercise of uh, regulatory, of, of scientific advocacy, uh, but not to throw the baby out with the bathwater by assuming that um, we can find perfectly disinterested scientists. Thank you. I'd uh, like to invite our speakers up to the bench uh, uh, behind me here uh, so we can uh, have uh, some Q&A from all of you. Uh, at the very beginning, since Tom uh, uh, joined us a little late but was here for the commentary, I was going to give, give Tom the chance to uh, offer some, some brief comments uh, of his own or some responses of his own, if he'd like, uh, and then we'll go to questions uh, from the audience. So, Tom. Sure, thanks. Um, well, I'm sorry I'm, I'm late. The, uh pilot didn't show up for our plane for about an hour. It was, that was honest to goodness truth. Uh, Probably some interested regulatory maybe, participant. Maybe so. Maybe, maybe so. I, I'm not sure. What, what, I, I think it was because uh, they just don't like Cleveland. But uh, I, uh, in, in, in any event, please, I, I certainly thank you for having me here. Uh, and uh, this is my first time in Cleveland, so I'm in, enjoying my stay here as well. Uh, once I got here, it, I spent too much time in Dallas-Fort Worth where I've met, spent many, many hours. Uh, in any event, uh, I guess l let me respond a little to what Don, Don had to say because uh, I was very happy to hear that he likes this book as much as he does. The last time I was at one of these that Don commented on a book that I wrote, he hated it. <laughs> and thought it was really, really, That's really a much better uh, book. Uh, dis dis disappointment. <laughs> um, so this is this is pleasing, and 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 in fact, I'll probably um, surprise Don to say a bit that I I kind of agree with him that it's very difficult to find disinterested scientists, and maybe that is a uh, a desideratum that we might uh, uh, strive for uh, but never achieve. I'm, I'm one of those one of the reasons I'm a proponent of technology-based standards is that, that uh, I'm an El Dorado kind of a guy, that I think that uh, the, the, the uh, 
the uh, good of the quest is, is in the quest itself and not so much in the getting there. So uh, I think that, 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 that to try to find disinterested scientists um, is at least something that's worth, worth doing. And in fact, uh, what, when it comes to advisory panels, for example, we use the National Academy of Sciences uh, example. There really are uh, kind of two models. One, the Federal Advisory Committee Act, which does talk about balance, and I'm very, I, I like that. And I do think that balance is one way to, uh, to deal with the possibility in some areas that there is no real uh, way to isolate or determine who's disinterested. And in fact, if we uh, did allow some government agency, for example, to, uh, to select uh, only, and we made the rule be only disinterested scientists, and the agency got to decide who those were, I would be worried about that, that system for fear that you would stack the panels just as easily uh, by, by the choices that you made. Um, so there is that uh, Federal Advisory Committee Act model. Uh, on the other hand, I think if you just expand the range of scientists so that you don't require for a particular issue, say, uh, uh, the uh, uh, dioxin, the, 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 uh, the uh, long-term effects of exposure to dioxin, it, if you don't limit the scientists there to scientists who have studied dioxin, in fact, if you don't limit it to scientists, toxicologists, but you let just scientists who understand science and how science is done uh, to participate in those panels, appoint those uh, folks, and don't require, don't, don't push this notion of expertise too hard because all good scientists know how to do science. And if what we're looking for really, as we suggest in the book, is to, um, uh, to find places where science is being bent uh, by looking very carefully at the, at, at the data, sometimes for the first time, uh, because peer review doesn't always work as well as we'd like for it to, uh, then I, you don't have to be a part of that specialty, I think. Now, the scientists have a lot, a lot of trouble with that. They're, they're very much into speci specialization. Uh, so it's, it, that's a hard sell uh, to the scientific community. Uh, he said, we don't have an example of disinterested scientists, but I think we do have an example, at least one, it, it, they were hard to find, but one example of disinterested science uh, I, uh, of putting together a panel of scientists who led or, or, or achieved what we regard to be a disinterested result, and that's the Health Effects Institute at, uh, at Harvard, uh, which, is, which was formed or, uh, by the automobile industry and uh, EPA uh, to deal with uh, uh, scientific issues to commission research and that sort of thing. But, but certain issues have been uh, uh, referred to, and we mentioned at least one in the book. We, we have more on HEI in the book. Uh, but part of that is the confidence that the public can have in what they do is it wasn't just scientists. The, the, the chairman of the board is Derek Bach, or at least when it got started. He's a lawyer, former dean of the Harvard Law School. People who uh, we uh, have some confidence in for their integrity. Uh, and I, I also tend to agree with Don that uh, perhaps we should have, if we were competent or capable of doing it, and we don't, didn't regard ourselves so much as competent in determining what the rules of conduct ought to be or what the, what the codes of conduct ought to be. Indeed, as the um, f sort of first draft of this book was going on, we, we talked about rules of conduct and suggested, well, there just aren't any. And we presented the manuscript at, at Albany two or three years ago now. Uh, and one of the uh, panelists, there was two or three panelists, or, or two or three participants in this, this workshop devoted to the manuscript which was a wonderful experience for us, uh, that included Bernie Goldstein, who Don knows really well. I said, well, you're just wrong about that. And the last, he was the, the um, uh, now I guess the dean at Pittsburgh Medical School. Was it Pittsburgh? Uh, is, it? is it? Yeah, he's not the dean anymore. But, but, but he was maybe at the time. <laughs> right. I, yeah. Well, you, you, you're, you're including too much you're within this word, or this concept of science. You're trying to, you're trying to do too much. And, I, I, and, and that's true. And I think what we intended to do uh, at early on in the book was limit the book's 
range to what we call policy relevant science. There's an awful lot of science out there that's not policy relevant at all. I, uh, perhaps because of this book, I was appointed to a panel of the National Academy of Sciences on the integrity of data in a, uh, an electronic age. And a lot of that science just flat isn't policy relevant. It has to do with terabytes of data coming down from the Hubble Space uh, Telescope uh, pointed at the heavens uh, and things that are doing, going on at the CERN proton accelerator. And maybe at some point that will be relevant, but at this point it really isn't. So there's a whole huge amount of science out there that isn't affected by uh, the, the problems that we, uh, that we see. Uh, I'm, I'm, I want for there to be time for questions, so I don't want to uh, take any more time than this. But thanks again for having me here. Thank you, Tom. Uh, are there questions from folks? Yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, I'm not sure the title. Professor Elliott? Yeah. Um, try that. Um, he, he taught my daughter. I know that. <laughs> Tom, <laughs> uh, but for the uh, for the code of conduct, it seemed like you offered two different alternative solutions for this. Whereas you could either professionalize it, or more like public regulation. So I was wondering, out of those two options, I kind of have a feeling which way you're leaning. But uh, out of the two options, which one do you think is stronger? Like uh, public regulation, like the SEC, or more professionalized, like a legal profession, just adding legal enforcement, which seemed. Is seen from uh, Professor Wagner's presentation, that's their approach. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think it ought to be both. Um, I think you need the expertise of the, of the scientists to help develop what the appropriate uh, criteria are, because I think, as, as Tom, Tom said, mm -hmm. it's hard for any of us outside of the uh, areas to really be smart enough about how data can be manipulated to identify that, but then I think it ought to be more than just a self-regulation by the profession. It ought to have some, it ought to have some teeth and enforcement mechanisms. So um, I think the, the model that we use in terms of uh, the law where you, where you have the profession that develops some recommended standards, but then they are ultimately adopted and enforced by public regulatory bodies would be the kind of thing I might, uh, I might have in mind. I, I do think some of the things are not that hard, um, and there's, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit in this area. Um, we do have a lot of people that are currently testifying before National Academy of Sciences panels are being paid to do that uh, and do not disclose that they are paid advocates rather than, uh, exor than, than, than uh, uh, and they masquerade as independent scientists. I think that's outrageous. That would not be permissible for a, a lawyer. Uh, if, you're, if you're testifying uh, and you're testifying not as uh, a disinterested uh, professor but as a, uh, uh, as, a, uh, as a paid advocate, you have an obligation to disclose that. So some of the stuff is, is uh, easy. Other stuff, and I think they give a lot of examples in the in the book of the subtler ways that studies can be manipulated. I think you need some uh, some uh, uh, some pro some professional societies to develop. But you know, um, I didn't. I actually have it in my briefcase. But the report that um, Wendy and some of her colleagues did for what. You, you showed that. Reform. Yeah, you showed that briefly in your PowerPoint. Right. They have nine uh, rules that they propose, and I think that's an excellent start. Uh, we don't have a, uh, we don't have a good enforcement mechanism, but I, I think uh, you, you know you could have some a pretty pretty clear uh, codes of conduct. But you start with the notion that if you are uh, that you, ha you have to disclose whether or not you're uh, an advocate for a position. And if you're an advocate for a position, then you're, what you say will be evaluated differently than if you're purporting to be a, a law professor. Other questions? Back here. We just wait for the microphone. Just to, it's, the event's being webcast, so folks, folks at home or wherever they are can hear as well. I should explain I'm a professor of epidemiology, so since that was brought up on this. I think there are domains for which we are disinterested. If you came to my department, we argue forever about how to cut or split or divide or what form of a regression model to use to do that. There's endless discussion. And some of our faculty will simply flip a coin and argue one side or the other. I just assume, as good lawyers would in this room, if asked to say, pick this side or that side of the case. There certainly are. Another major area of, of interest 
is just pet enthusiasm. I have a theory about the, how the world works. I really will look for the data uh, to support my theory. Not, I'm not, it's not a drug company or anything like that. I'm making my career on X theory and I'll try and design the evidence in that way. I think the thing that is really missed at the core, science is driven really by replication. Uh, you may have an impassioned feeling one way or another, but do other people with exactly the opposite views right. do this? And I think one of the important things we could do is very clearly make sure that studies that are put forward could be repeated and are carefully enough designed so that, uh, or and reported so this can be found. Right, that's a great point. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. I think we'd all agree with that. And one of the norms ought to be that there be enough disclosure in the publication that it, it's, it's susceptible to, to people attempting to uh, replicate it. And they do, in fact, talk about that in the book. I would just, I would just make one point, if I could, about the, uh, the point you made about disinterestedness. Um, I've, I've spent the last eight years as the lawyer on the Board of Environmental Studies and Toxicology at the National Academy. I'm about to uh, uh, reach my term limit, and one of the two of you, one of the three of you, would be a very good person to uh, replace me. But one of the things that the National Academy uh, has done for many years is make a strong distinction between what they call conflict of interest and what they call bias. And I think that um, there are financial and other kinds of conflicts of interest in the outcome that are not are not waivable and are disqualifying. Then there are other things like biases, a commitment to a particular scientific theory or prior publications. Those need to be disclosed so people can evaluate them, but they're not necessarily disqualifying. And I do think it's a, it's a helpful uh, a distinction. I would not necessarily disqualify somebody if they had a financial conflict of interest. But I think their financial conflict of interest should clearly be disclosed so that somebody who is functioning as an advocate can't be masquerading as a non-advocate. Um, just, just one further point. When it comes to epidemiology, um, one thing that this committee I was on has run into is uh, sometimes if what you're talking about is gathering the data again in terms of replication rather than just reworking the statistics, it can't be done, right? Uh, you can't, I mean, the, the history is the history of Hiroshima, and we're not going to have another bomb just so we can rec to, to replicate the data, right? Uh, and, and that's true in, in, uh, in epidemiology. It's also true in astrophysics to some extent. I was going to take the moderator's prerogative to, to throw something out for the whole panel. In terms of one thing that came up in the discussion is what drives the pressure to bend science. And obviously one of the issues is, is that in tort litigation, in regulatory decisions, there's a lot of money on the table. And if, if industry or whomever else has money at stake, they have a strong incentive to influence that decision. I'm wondering if, if another uh, factor that leads to the tremendous pressure to uh, influence science is that we both have statutes as well as a, a broader policy culture, which sometimes masks what are essentially normative policy judgments as if they were scientific judgments. Oh, sure. So we say sound science compels X, when really what we're saying is from a particular uh, uh, value commitment about how precautionary we should be or, or how we should weigh certain types of things, we, we would choose one or the other. And that, that given our political culture that is susceptible to that, and in some cases even a regulatory structure that's susceptible to that, it makes science a trump card uh, over what should really be wide open debates and, and, and about values and, and normative preferences. Well, well, Wendy's the obvious person to answer that one, having written this, the, the seminal article on the science charade years ago. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree uh, that sometimes <laughs> science is used as a trump card. Absolutely. We don't talk about those issues in this book, though. Um, we're talking about sort of more raw scientific research. Um, but absolutely, science is misused. Frankly, that's another reason to try to dodge it. Um, it we don't do a good job in public policy with science. So that's yet another problem that we keep encountering. So we'll keep fighting with Don at dinner about how we need to really yeah, I mean, have all the science used in public policy unless absolutely I, necessary. Not to put the epidemiologist out of a job, of course, but yeah. everybody else maybe, yeah. Yeah, so uh, this is a, a lifelong conversation among the, uh, the, the four of us. Um, uh, Wendy and, and Tom and I uh, were in a uh, dialogue at the administrative law section, and I think in 1999 or 2001, which we published oh, about true. some of these issues. The way I model it, and this is based in part on my experience at, at EPA, 
uh, is that uh, that science does not uh, decide uh, most issues, uh, but what it does do is it it often defines the range of discourse within which policy judgments can be made. In other words, there are often in regulatory decisions um, limits to uh, results that would be indefensible in terms of uh, indefensible under the science one way or the other. Um, uh, but you almost never have a situation where, where science specifies a unique result. So you often have a situation where the science will, uh, imperfect as it is, uh, you know, establish a, a range. And I think that's why, to some extent, the invocation of technology-based standards, while uh, useful and something that I would support, it doesn't really make the problem of science go away because you have to decide what things are sufficiently hazardous that you want to use technology-based standards to regulate them in the, uh, you know, in the in the first place, and you can't develop technology-based standards for everything all at once. So you have to set some priorities. But I think we'd all we'd all agree that science does not eliminate the need for public policy, and sometimes it's misused as a as a rhetorical uh, rhetorical resource. So it's really a question of. How you know how much how much science and and really I think more a question of when to make a decision when do you have enough science when is the science mature enough that you should make a decision now as opposed to wait until a later date uh, when you may have uh, more science. We have time for one final question. If there, I'm sure, there's someone somewhere. This is sort of mundane and concrete, if you'll forgive this, but as a lawyer representing a client, often uh, when we have an obligation not to present false information. So if you're a lawyer representing a company in, for instance, an administrative proceeding, um, or well, more commonly would be a tort case, but I, my experience would be administrative proceedings, in the concept of the ethical advocate, could you comment on the function of the attorney when presented with scientific data by one's client uh, in terms of finding another way possibly to police this unsound or bent science? Yeah, well, I think that's an excellent point. I, I think a, uh, an attorney uh, would, not be, uh, would not be permitted under the current rules of professional conduct to present information given to him or her by a client which he or she knows uh, is, is false or, mis, or misleading. The difficulty is that the, um, the current ethical rules use the word knows <laughs> rather than suspects and do not uh, necessarily impose a, a duty of uh, uh, investigation. Uh, and that's been a very controversial issue uh, with the SEC and others taking the position that attorneys ought to have an, an affirmative duty of uh, investigation. But I, I do think you make an excellent point that one of the ways that we could develop some of these codes of conduct is by using the attorneys as essentially gatekeepers. Uh, and I think that's an excellent uh, way, way to look at it. See, one of the problems with the code of conduct approach is that there aren't necessarily professional societies or certifications for, for science advocates because that profession is still in its infancy. So you can't disbar someone from being a science advocate. Uh, you'd, you'd have to uh, either use the professional societies to certify people, or I think a better approach really is uh, that people ought to be admitted, that scientists ought to be admitted to practice before particular agencies in the same way that lawyers mm. are. Uh, and that in order to do that, there could be there could be roles, and somebody could be uh, could be disbarred from continuing to practice before the FDA or the uh, EPA if they were found guilty of scientific misconduct. But I, I think what Wendy and and Tom have done is, is surface a really big problem, and I think that uh, you know now we enter the age of really trying to figure out how we're going to grapple with it and how we're going to how we're going to solve it. Uh, but I, I think we have to uh, accept the notion that people are going to be interested um, in the outcome and are going to uh, employ scientifically trained people as, as advocates. So I think we have to develop the, the, ro the, the rules of the road. I mean, one way to think about it is, you know, the adversary system is inherently con combat, 
but it ought to be combat conducted under Marcus of Queensbury rules rather than total war in which anything goes. And the problem in this area is because it's just emerging, we, we don't have the Marcus of Queenberry rules as to what is and is not legitimate. I think that's exactly the line drawing problem that, that Chris was, was pointing to and really runs throughout the book. We've got to decide what is legitimate, what is not legitimate. We have to then have clear signals that this goes too far and some sanction for people who goes too far. We don't have any of that yet, and that's, that's, it's like the old Wild West. Uh, just one, one point, and that is Wendy and I struggled for hours and hours and hours about this, uh, which was sh uh, should we try in the recommendation section to define what's legitimate and what's not legitimate? And we finally came to the conclusion that that, that really isn't our place because we, you need to know much more than we knew or, or were willing to try to find out. <laughs> Uh, in the amount of time that we had uh, to, to, to do that. So we, we certainly considered it. We certainly, well, there's we some other books. There a certain, um, other people can write books in this that's area, right. too. That's right. Need, we, that's, just, that, that, you, was, that was my you, invitation you, to you, you guys you, to write. To, you, you guys created the field. You, know, yeah. you, you started the field. You hadn't necessarily finished it yet. That's right. It's up to, up to people like you, Don, to go ahead and <laughs> tell <laughs> us what that. <laughs> What a note to end on. Right. Well, uh, please, first, please uh, join me in, in uh, thanking Wendy, Tom, Chris, and Don. Thank you so much. Uh, very quick, we have a, there's a reception on the other side of this wall here in the lower rotunda. Please join us there. Uh, also, uh, this event was webcast, so if you enjoyed it, want to watch it again, recommend it to others. It will be archived on uh, the Case website. But uh, thank you all, and have a good evening. They guaranteed to publish them that they they have basically said they'd like to look at uh, right. what goes out of this. And, and oh, really? That would be great. Sure. You need to show this because I, I, it might be contraband because it has illegal.